Um, FSD Kenya has been around since 2005. Um, we are a charitable trust that was founded by uh, international funders. Um, initially, the Department for International Development from the UK, um, and currently we're funded by Swedish CEDA and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The reason we were created was to help provide services to the Kenyan financial market, to help the Kenyan financial market serve low-income people and small and medium enterprises. My role uh, as CEO is to lead the organization, the strategy development and the execution of that strategy, um, along with a fantastic team. And I know this fantastic team because I've been a part of the team since 2014, um, when I used to head our innovations work. We have more than tripled um, financial inclusion in the country and are now at 83% formal financial inclusion. Much of that growth has been driven by mobile money and mobile enabled financial services and I think it's something we all should be quite proud of. However, we don't think that just having an account is enough. If the financial market's really going to work for people, really going to meet their needs, it's got to do more than just provide an account. And so now we, we talk about not so much financial inclusion, but inclusive finance. And inclusive finance means that um, the financial market includes everyone, but also despite the increase in financial inclusion in Kenya, we are seeing a decrease in the financial health of Kenyan families. So for example, from 2016 to 2019, FinAccess access data that is done by the Central Bank of Kenya, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and us, um, showed that financial health has dropped. It helps people receive an income. It helps people send money to help their friends and family from across distances. It helps people manage risks whether it's insurance or other types of service that helps people when they're down. And I think it helps businesses grow. And we see that businesses um, need lots of different kinds of finance. The percent of Kenyans who are borrowing from any source has now reached 50% of the population. And in a lot of ways, that's a great thing. Access to credit is often a constraint for families. It's something that holds them back. It holds businesses back. But credit needs to be matched appropriately to the need that it's being served. And uh, especially, it's most effective when it's helping uh, with productive uh, growth of a family. For example, being able to borrow for expanding a business or education. I think it's, it's no secret um, that some of the digital lenders have not been responsible. You know, if you open your phone and you go to the Play Store and you look for digital lenders in Kenya, you'll find a plethora of uh, apps that you can download. Some of those are legitimate and some are not. And so I, I, I don't think that it's, it would be fair to say that all, the digital, all of the unregulated digital lenders, because obviously several of the banks are also doing digital lending, um, but I would say that the unregulated digital lenders, some of them are being very careful to be transparent about pricing and terms, to make sure that people know what it is they're downloading when they download it. They're um, much more careful about privacy issues, and they um, also have more flexible payment terms. So I think one of the most egregious ones we've heard about is unbeknownst to a customer having their contact list contacted when they're behind on payments and that, that seems quite out of, um, out of bounds. Although interestingly, I think in Kenyan microfinance community and in the SACO community, it's very normal for you to say, have a, a group guarantee or a group um, accountability for credit. So there's nothing wrong with saying the lender can contact someone, but the point is those people were not asked, is it okay if I use these contacts as part of the accountability and repayment mechanism. And if they don't ask, then it's not appropriate to use it in the collection practices. So I'm not an expert on interest rate caps, but from, my, from what I know, 
uh, there have been very, very few, if any, examples of rate caps that have really achieved what they wanted to. I would say the one exception is that there are a couple of countries who have something that's called a usury cap. And that's different than a rate cap because it's saying that there's this number way up here that nobody under any circumstances should go beyond. And one of the problems of interest rate caps is that it prevents lenders from being able to make risk-based lending pricing decisions. So there's some people right now that the banks say, I can't lend to at this rate, but I would be willing to lend to at this rate based on the historical data of this type of borrower or of this specific borrower. And so I think interest rate caps that are looking at usury, which is egregious and over lending, can be very powerful. Um, but interest rate caps that are set um, very close to the cost, the price of government paper are not going to be effective. One of the things that I'm disappointed about, about the interest rate caps, is how the banks, who are meant to be intermediating funds between Kenyan businesses and, and families and Kenyan businesses and families, have shifted so much of their resources into government paper because it provides a relatively risk-free return um, and I think that's um, that's been a detriment to Kenya's growth story and this is a country with so much potential you don't want to constrain capital um, to sectors with potential for growth so I think it was a huge huge development in the market when the banks not only provided negative credit data but they provided positive data and that story has not been perfect not all of the data has got in there when it needed to and I think there's still some um, kinks being worked out in the system whether it is or not I don't have the data to verify um, anecdotally I've heard positive stories of people who've been able to leverage positive um, repayment on a non-traditional uh, loan to a more traditional loan. So for example, positive data on my SACO loan contributing to a positive decision on my uh, bank loan. You know, uh, many years ago I was a credit officer at Equity Bank and I uh, remember very fondly that we would have to collect all this paper to approve a loan. And one of the pieces of paper we always had to collect was the bank statements from someone or if they had other loans, right? But especially those bank statements. In paper format, stapled together with stamps and signatures. The banks have all that data digitally. Why can't that data flow from one bank to the other without the credit officer having to make a big folder with lots of pieces of paper in it? And so if we could find ways of not just getting the positive credit data, but all of my banking data, then I think that the banks will have a much fuller picture of who I am and my credit capacity and would be able to make better lending decisions that are good for them and good for me. I think that the traditional banks are very careful with consumer data. Um, that said, a lot of consumer data is in hard copy files. You know, it's, it's your signature page and it's in a big folder and you've probably seen these yeah. file rooms. Um, I think the di digital data is very carefully um, managed um, based on what I've seen. Uh, and, and that's on the security and safety of the data. I'm, I'm not worried about banks leaking data or people crack um, it to, to the public. Uh, that said, I don't think it's effective. It's the technology that we have today enables so much more to be done with the data the banks have. And banks are not using the data that they, even the, the data they already have in the most robust way. And so if they could leverage the tools that are available with say machine learning and um, just even more um, advanced data analytics, I think they'd be able to identify more opportunities to serve their customers better, probably drive their revenues up, reduce their risks, and, and I'd love to see more of that, even within one bank, and then across banks, um, the ability for consumers to be able to leverage that. We see in our data, and it's no secret, that many, many Kenyans have more than one bank account. And there are lots of reasons for that, but one reason is that this bank will lend to me, this bank is where my salary gets paid, and my, and you know, there, there's just the, the ability to port my payments and my loans and all of that between banks um, is pretty nascent still in Kenya. There's a lot of barriers to switching.
I think it's good that there is a live conversation around data privacy and consumer protection. Um, I think um, there are uh, bills that are being debated and I think that those are good steps in the right direction to ensure that consumers' privacy is, is being handled. Um, and, and so I'd like to see where that goes and I'd like to, uh, I'll, we, we as F, at FSD Kenny will be following that closely. But I think it's important to um, bear in mind we want data privacy, but we also want the power of data. And so being, for consumers to be able to leverage their own data to achieve their own goals is important, at the same time protecting their privacy and the data that they have. And I think there are um, loose standards at play, and there are some people, or some entities in Kenya who have a lot of data and um, may or may not be willing to share that data with a consumer or a, allow a consumer to have their data shared. Um, and that's something we'd love to see develop as this, um, as Kenya catches up to the global conversation on um, data protection. So um, at FSD Kenya, we don't have a formal view on this. Yeah. Um, and you've seen the statements that have been made in the papers. Um, I think it is interesting to note that Facebook only came up with this after they came and visited Kenya and spent some time with MPISA. So I think it's fair to say that MPISA has been an inspiration um, for what they've developed. Uh, I, I think it's, I think there's a lot of potential and I'd love to see more ideas like this. Um, but I, I would say the jury's still out on whether this cool new tech enabled thing will actually deliver value to the people it's intended to serve. And so, yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm going to follow it closely like I'm sure many others will.